Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Paria Sabiri. She's an associate professor at CAPS, uh, the Division of Prevention Science, where she currently holds multiple NIH awards, including an R01, an R34, an R21, as well as funding from the California HIV Research Program. And her research um, includes assessing technology-based strategies, such as mobile applications, video conferencing tools, and text messaging to improve adherence to antiretroviral medications and engagement in HIV care among youth living with HIV. She's also examining novel adherence assessment methods and an HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis tool for healthcare providers who are prescribing PrEP. She's also currently an expert consultant at the National Clinicians Consultation Center's HIV Warm Line, PEP Line, and PrEP Line. And um, we're excited to have you here, Paria. Take it away. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Yep, yeah, okay, great. Um, so thank you so much, Sherry, for the introduction, and thank you so much also to Rochelle and everyone who organized this uh, presentation. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting with Courtney and Ida and Judy, so I'm a little nervous both for today, uh, elections, and for presenting with some of my favorite people. Um, so I am going to talk about uh, a project that I have been working on, and I feel like my slides are stuck now. Ah. There we go. Um, on pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. And I'm not gonna go into detail on what pre-exposure prophylaxis is. I'm sure everybody here is well aware of that. Um, and um, so just to quickly dive in is that pre-exposure prophylaxis is um, really only straightforward if a lot of different conditions are met, including the provider being knowledgeable about PrEP, asking about sex and drug use in a non-judgmental way, uh, figuring out uh, insurance coverage issues, doing all the safety labs, um, and also that a lot of conditions have to be met about the patient. So kidney function being okay, um, you know, not having any uh, uh, history of osteopenia or osteoporosis, hepatitis B surface antigen being negative, and being relatively adherent. So this is a result. Uh, this is a, these are uh, some maps from AIDS View, and if you get a chance, I highly recommend looking at them. They have a prep to need ratio, which basically is a surrogate of how much additional resources need to be uh, uh, spent to, uh, to increase PrEP use. And as you can see, there's been some progress between 2017 and 2018, but still a lot of white space uh, uh, in, in the map of the US, uh, meaning that we need that more uh, um, work and coverage. And some data from the CDC is that about 1.2 million individuals had a PrEP indication in 2018. And uh, while PrEP uh, uh, coverage has gone up from 9% to about 18% from 2016 to 2018, there's still a lot of disparities, particularly in those of younger age, racial ethnic groups, uh, and geographic disparities. And one of the barriers that has been uh, looked at, and I think it was one of the first barriers that I thought would, would be the most important to look at, look at, is a lack of provider knowledge and willingness to prescribe PrEP. And as a priority step, the need to increase knowledge among providers and increase interventions to facilitate PrEP delivery um, has been uh, indicated as a, an important priority step. So that's where the study PrEP OI, uh, or PrEP Optimization Intervention, came in, was basically to increase PrEP uptake and persistence by targeting providers. And the intervention included a, a PrEP coordinator, um, and I'll go into details on what they do, but essentially they're a liaison between the provider and the patient to try to increase uh, PrEP uptake and uh, persistence. And we also developed a tool called PrepRx, which is a web-based panel management tool that basically was there to help PrEP coordinators and providers to increase uh, the efficiency um, and the uh, efficiency of PrEP uh, start and also um, adhering to a lot of the CDC guidelines, um, which are just very tedious um, at times. So the primary aim of the study was to increase PrEP prescriptions using a stepped wedge design among 10 primary care uh, clinical sites. So it was actually 12 clinics, but three of the clinics were combined because they all um, had similar staff and, and similar patient population, so we call them 10 clinic sites. And the idea was that the intervention would uh, span the entire PrEP uh, um, cascade. So really quickly, the PrEP coordinator's job was essentially to do everything 
uh, that a, any medical provider would do short of signing off on the prescription and answering any clinical questions. So essentially they would do all the appointment scheduling, the monitoring, the STI self-swabbing, teaching, um, assessing for HIV risk, even writing the prescription so that the provider could sign off on it, um, and then doing everything thereafter, all the, uh, uh, the weekly, monthly, quarterly visits, um, and all the, uh, um, the lab appointments. Um, and the PrepRx uh, tool that we had created, uh, uh, and this was using a Salesforce uh, backend, um, was to essentially increase efficiency of the workflow of the PrEP coordinator. And it included, uh, it includes a survey to assess risk. So the questions are very clear and it's pretty comprehensive. It has these automated reminders. So the PrEP coordinator just gets notifications whenever the patient's due for anything. And it has a PrEP timeline. So you can see very easily where a patient is within their PrEP use or in prior PrEP uh, timelines. So as I said before, there were 12 clinics, three of them bunched together for 10 clinical sites, and they were randomized in this stepped wedge design. Um, and uh, essentially the study uh, went until uh, September of 2019, and then we had a one-year follow-up phase uh, until September 30th, 2020. Um, and of course, that's when the pandemic occurred <laughs> during that time. So the, the data that I'm gonna present are from uh, the time of the pandemic and how we, we uh, modified the study to um, make it fit. In the meantime, I also had done a, another study. Um, it, it was an uh, online survey of individuals who are on 2-1-1 PrEP. Um, and essentially, some barriers were identified that I thought were interesting, um, including uh, patients saying that they encountered uh, difficulties with getting their lab tests, refills, uh, appointments um, with their providers, communication with their providers. And for a lot of uh, individuals, they had either completely stopped having sex, um, were exclusively meeting with prior known partners, um, uh, or um, yeah, or just uh, having less frequent sex. So we, just, we really wanted to address some of these problems that we were hearing both on the survey and also verbally from the patients from the clinics. So there was four uh, responses that we had. Um, and, um, and I've basically been working on having uh, remote research um, uh, or promoting remote research since I, I, I wanna say 2011. Um, and really the pandemic, unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately was, um, really fit within that model. So PrEP OI was already set for a remote delivery of services because we were already doing telehealth and text messaging. So we just really increased that by allowing the PrEP coordinators to work from home so that it would also reduce the patient visits to the clinics and allow for continuous support. And this was actually really important for a lot of the patients because they were, they were uh, given a contact uh, in a person um, through text messaging um, that had a relationship with their clinic. So they can very easily text message their PrEP coordinators, even for things that weren't even related to PrEP, um, to be able to get the attention of their medical provider. So this also uh, helped with refilling medications, um, uh, uh, discussions around STI symptoms, um, and also people uh, experiencing side effects from PrEP. Uh, on top of that, um, it allowed for the PrEP coordinators to discuss options instead of having someone discontinue PrEP altogether, what may be some other options, and I'll go into that in a second as well. So our response number two was to come up with our own guidance because essentially the CDC guidelines require uh, quarterly labs, and that's that was really just too much for the clinics and the patients. A lot of clinics had reduced hours, uh, their labs, some of them were closed, um, and also a lot of patients just didn't want to come to the clinics because of fear of exposure. So we basically revised our, our own guidelines. Um, so essentially, we did two things. One is that we defined what was an essential in-person visit. So that included when patients were starting PrEP for the first time, so for their initiation labs. So that was really important to get people into clinic. The second was for any follow-up lab, if patients hadn't done labs in the past six months, um, on top of that, if anyone was experiencing any side effects um, or STI symptoms, which sometimes also resembled some of the um, 
acute HIV or COVID-19 symptoms. On top of that, we uh, determine when patients can come in. So we uh, basically had this guidance that if someone was already adhering to PrEP, they'd been coming in for labs, they didn't report any signs and symptoms of uh, any uh, uh, HIV or STIs, they, instead of doing quarterly labs, we would do labs every six months, and then we would refill their meds for an additional three months. If someone was having any problems with adherence, but they weren't reporting any acute symptoms of HIV, we would refill their meds for an additional month after their three month test, um, and then have them come in, uh, uh, instead of coming in quarterly, they'd be, they'd be coming in every uh, four months. And then if anyone reported any acute symptoms, we would coordinate for them to uh, speak with their provider. And of course, the CDC eventually did come out with guidelines, but it wasn't until May of uh, May 15th, so about two months later. Um, and it, actually, the guidance was quite similar to what we had already said. So it was it was great that you know we were able to take action so quickly. Our response number three was to um, provide options. So instead of having people either be on prep or not be on prep. Um, for all the uh, MSM and transgender women uh, in our population, which is the, the vast majority, we uh, even handily discussed two on one prep. So, this is when you take a double dose two to 24 hours before sex, a single dose 24 hours after the double dose, and then a single dose 24 hours after that. Um, and we told patients that this is an option that instead of discontinuing, they could consider this. So, we are not losing all of the uh, HIV prevention um, uh, models and, and, and successes that we have uh, we had gained. And then the fourth thing was that um, through an administrative supplement, we were able to uh, work with a remote lab um, so that patients could eventually do labs remotely as well. So um, again, this was because of the lab closures and um, patients being reluctant to go in. Um, so we basically worked with uh, a group called Molecular Testing Lab um, and applied, uh, I applied for this uh, COVID-19 administrative supplement um, to look at feasibility and acceptability of doing HIV prep labs as well as uh, SARS-CoV-2 labs um, remotely. So this just really quickly um, is for 100 patients who are on prep um, and covered by our study and the test um, would be a five drops of blood um, for a dried blood spot where they do fourth generation HIV testing, which is really important. Serum creatinine, hep B, hep C, uh, syphilis. Uh, we're doing SARS-CoV-2 antibodies and, and pregnancy tests as needed. There's a three site uh, STI uh, uh, swabbing as well as, well as a, a self-collected nasal uh, swabbing. And there's an Oscar winning video on this website, um, prep.ucsf.edu, which is our website, um, with my uh, darling husband as my, uh, my model, uh, demonstrating each of these labs, not including the rectal swab though. <laughs> but you'll see, it's, it's really cute. So these are data I haven't, we haven't yet published, but we will soon. And essentially, I think uh, what's really important is to show that uh, from January before the pandemic until September, and we, I just got the data from October uh, and had, didn't have a chance to update the slide. Essentially, we saw no change um, in PrEP use. Um, so, you know, while a lot of other clinics like, you know, uh, their data from Boston, from our own Kaiser here in Northern California, um, as well as other countries like Australia, where they've shown a huge dip in their uh, PrEP use over time, we basically didn't really see uh, a much difference um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Now, we didn't have the growth that we were having before the pandemic, but at least we were able to sustain people. So in blue, you have the people who are actively on PrEP. So um, they've told the PrEP coordinator that they're putting a PrEP dose in their mouth. Um, so essentially, um, there was really no, no change. So just a quick acknowledgement of all the individuals who uh, helped and we're co-investigators on the study in the National Institute of Nursing Research. And this is our website and has a ton of tools in different languages as well, um, if you uh, wanna check it out. So I will stop there. Thanks, Paria, that's amazing. So um, it's amazing that you were able to maintain um, prep use at the pre-COVID levels during COVID. So congratulations to you and your team. Thank you. Um, I think